Great. Should we jump in? Yes, let's do it. Ashley and I met Dr. Beta up at a conference forever ago after we became aware of her. I'll let you cover it all in the introduction. And she was gracious enough to have us give us a tour of her lab and she's lovely and we're just so excited to hear from her and let parents know about her and, um, you know, let people become aware of the growing number of scientists that are that are working in this space. And so thank you for making time, Dr. Beta. And thank you for organizing all of this, Sydney. And thank you to everybody else who's here. We've got some really great parents on this call and a few, a few new friends. So looking forward to it. Over awesome. to you, Sydney. All right. Well, we're very excited to continue our SRF webinar series with Dr. Beta today, obviously. Uh, the goals of our series are to get you closer to the science, to make you aware of research and opportunities to participate and to empower your communication with your clinicians. So we wanna give you a little plug for our next webinar in the series, which is gonna be on August 3rd at 12 EST. That's gonna be with Dr. Elizabeth Heller and her work on epigenetics and gene regulation. So as you may know, SYNGAP Research Fund is currently fundraising for a grant which, allow, which would allow Dr. Heller to bring her expertise on these topics to the sphere of SYNGAP1 research. Um, so again, that's gonna be August 3rd at 12. Um, Eastern Time. So today's speaker is Dr. Helen Beta. She is the Assistant Professor of Neurobiology at UC Berkeley, where she's been conducting research since 2013. She earned her PhD at Rockefeller University, and her postgraduate work was done at Harvard Medical School with Dr. Bernardo Sabatini. It was there while she was studying the mTOR signaling pathway that she became interested in genetic mutations, which affect synaptic function and plasticity and lead to the phenotypes of various neurodevelopmental disorders in ASD. Her lab describes one of its main focuses as understanding the molecular machinery that allows neurons to be both dynamic and maintain balance. This is done through a multifaceted approach, which includes characterization of both mouse and human cells in various diseases. One of the main disorders she has studied so far is tuber sclerosis complex, and her lab has identified some synaptic changes which they believe may lead to the rigidity in behavior and learning that are seen in the TSC mouse models. She was also part of a collaboration which used CRISPR technologies to create organoids, which allowed her team to better replicate certain aspects of TSC, which the mouse models were not able to. Over the years, she became interested in SYNGAP mutations as their connection to the ASD became apparent. The preliminary work in her lab suggests that loss of SYNGAP1 from the striatal neurons is likely to alter their function and may be an important contributor to the repetitive, restricted, and inflexible behaviors observed in SYNGAP1 disorder. Um, and then, of course, as Mike mentioned, he and Ashley were able to visit her lab, and this is what Ashley had to say about uh, Dr. Beta. She says, my greatest memory of her was the several hours she spent with us when we visited her lab last year. She described the activities and experiments she was doing with the mice with so much care and attention and was keenly interested in whether and what analogous behaviors we also saw in our Syngapians. So I now have the pleasure of turning things over to Dr. Beta, whose talk today is entitled, Loss of Syngap Function in the Striatum Leads to Altered Motor and Habit Learning. Dr. Beta, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you and tell you a little bit about um, some of our work, our ongoing project um, looking at Syngap. I'm excited that I do have some kind of fresh, off, hot off the press data to share with you about our early findings of how Syngap1 affects um, the function of this brain region called the striatum, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. So I think, um, let's see, am I able to share my screen? I think I might um, need to get permission for that. All right, can everyone see that those slides okay? And let's see if, okay, perfect. Okay, so again, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and I'll try to um, not give too long of a um, talk because I would love to have questions and discussions and, and hear your thoughts and um, get your opinion, so. All right, so just a very quick kind of overview. This is a, just a schematic that kind of generally shows what my lab is interested in understanding. So we are neuroscientists and our kind of um, main area is to try to understand the basic biology of kind of how the brain works at the broadest level. And so we're interested in starting down from genetic and molecular level to understanding how genes and molecular pathways actually affect the structure and function of brain cells called neurons. 
And of course, we're very interested in understanding how these neurons communicate through synaptic connections and ultimately how this synaptic activity drives changes in the activity of neural networks that ultimately affect our cognition, our behavior, our thoughts and our actions. So this is our kind of general goal of what we would like to understand. Um, and we are particularly interested in understanding um, how kind of this process or these pathways go wrong in states of disease. And to study this, we have been focused on genetic disorders um, because I think this is a reasonable starting point. If we know the genes that are mutated, um, that gives us a tractable system to begin to decipher kind of this black box of how these genes or how disruption of these genes affect molecular pathways, neuronal function, the connections and communication between neurons, et cetera, and ultimately how these changes at the cellular molecular level or circuit level will lead to a disease state. And so this has kind of been the model for how we um, address these questions in the lab. All right, and yeah, so in our lab, we do experiments at multiple levels, again, um, all the way from molecular to the function of individual brain cells, all the way up to the function of, of neural circuits. Okay, so where do we start in terms of kind of which genes or which disorders do we tackle? And I've um, been interested for some time in neurodevelopmental disorders, in particular um, autism spectrum disorders. And so this is just um, kind of an overly complicated schematic that shows um, an image of a synapse, which is the connection point between two neurons um, across which neurotransmitter is released. And it shows you um, a subset of the proteins that are involved in this synaptic transmission or synaptic communication. Um, and the point here is that it's complex, that there are many proteins that need to work together in a coordinated way to enable proper synaptic communication, um, which is kind of the fundamental basis of, of how our brain works. And so what this um, image shows is some of these proteins. And then in this orange color are proteins whose genes have been shown to be mutated um, in certain forms of autism spectrum disorder or, or related neurodevelopmental disorders. So you can see um, kind of one theme that has emerged is that a lot of these genes encode proteins that function at the synapse, even though their specific biological activity is fairly diverse. And so these are kind of the genes and the proteins that we are really interested in studying. Um, of course, there's many, so we have to kind of choose um, where to start. Um, and so as Sydney and Mike mentioned, my lab has been so far primarily focused on one of these genes or two of these genes here, which are called TSC1 and TSC2. And I'll tell you very briefly a little bit um, about that. But um, really, we, we started by looking at TSC, um, but then we were interested to know if what we found in terms of how TSC mutations affect synapses and affect behavior could be relatable to these other autism risk disorder genes. And so we've recently expanded to looking at other genes. And as Mike said, I attended a SYNGAP conference a couple of years ago and got really kind of interested and excited about SYNGAP in terms of its interesting functions and um, there, I think, are some key similarities in um, syngap disorder that are kind of um, also seen for TSC. So I thought we might have um, some knowledge that we could share to dive into this. So um, just very quickly, um, again, because most of our work has been on TSC, I just want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about our TSC work. So basically, um, TSD stands for tuber sclerosis complex. And it's caused by mutations in these genes, which are TSC1 or TSC2. And the protein products of these genes form a complex that regulates a signaling pathway called mTOR. And I won't, I won't go into that too much today. Um, it's a rare disorder, but it's not um, completely uh, uncommon. It's a syndromic disorder. So there are um, medical concerns, specifically with benign tumors that can occur in different organs. But the neurological and psychiatric aspects of TSC are often the most burdensome um, for patients and caregivers. And so these range from these um, physical malformations um, in the brain that happen during embryonic development, which are called tubers or cortical tubers. This is where the disease gets, gets its name. 
Um, and then there's a lot of um, overlap, I think, with some of the um, aspects of um, SYNGAP1 disorders, which include very high rates of epilepsy, which is, um, has childhood onset, can often be intractable. Um, there's varying degrees of intellectual disability, and there's a very high prevalence um, of autism spectrum disorder. About 50% of TSC patients receive an autism diagnosis, um, and many others have kind of behavioral um, signs of autism, but there's also um, quite a number of other psychiatric and behavioral conditions that are frequently um, seen in TSC individuals. And so again, my lab has been very interested in understanding how this mutation and alteration in this pathway affect neuronal and synaptic function to lead to this kind of constellation of, of psychiatric um, and behavioral challenges. Um, and one thing that's kind of been um, focused on or, or come to the forefront recently, and I showed this slide um, to Mike and Ashley and when they visited my lab and we're kind of looking at some of these shared things. So this is um, in TSC and this is supposed to be kind of an umbrella that's showing these um, plethora of psychiatric and behavioral challenges that individuals with TSC face. And again, I think many of these um, may also be seen in individuals with Syngap as well. Um, and so this is just to show that there are a number of behavioral problems like um, aggression, inattention, impulsivity, repetitive behavior, sleep problems, um, psychiatric diagnoses like autism, ADHD, um, and mood disorders. And then there are also kind of cognitive, um, specific cognitive deficits or problems with cognitive flexibility. And so these aspects of TSC had been kind of understudied. Most researchers had focused on the epilepsy, which is a major problem. And so my lab kind of, we were interested in tackling where do these behavioral and psychiatric problems come from and could we identify kind of the cellular molecular circuit basis for these. And so I'll just, um, oh, sorry, before I get into that, I'll just highlight, I guess, one um, of these aspects, which is autism, which encompasses kind of an, a, a several different um, behavioral challenges. And so I, I imagine many of you are aware of this. This is just showing the diagnostic criteria for autism. So what most people think of are these um, social impairments, which are impairments in social communication and interaction. Um, but the second um, main diagnostic criteria for ASD are these restricted repetitive patterns of behavior interests. And these, I think, have been perhaps a little bit less studied um, in the autism research fields, but they include things like um, simple motor stereotypies, um, repetitive movements, um, but then they can be kind of more complex repetitive restricted behaviors like insistence on sameness or um, inflexibility or strong adherence to routines or rituals. Um, and these can be fairly intense in, um, in terms of highly fixated on specific objects or specific activities. And so this um, is something that's very much seen in indiv individuals with TSC and as far as I've kind of understood also prevalence in in kids with, with Syngap disorder. And so we thought we um, were interested in tackling specifically this aspect um, and trying to understand where these um, behavioral changes are coming from. Um, and so what we thought of is that um, maybe these behavioral changes um, or these kind of more motor aspects of autism could be driven by changes in this brain structure or this brain circuit called the basal ganglia. Um, and so this is a kind of image, a schematic image of, of a slice through a mouse brain, but um, human brain has the same structures and the same circuits. Um, and these are kind of the main brain regions that are within the basal ganglia. And it's, you can see fairly complex circuits, which I, I won't go into too much, but the job of this, of these brain regions and these brain circuits are to help you decide which actions to take in a given circumstance. So to um, kind of understand the context and the environment and choose the appropriate action or the appropriate response. Um, and then another thing that this brain region does is help you kind of learn um, motor routines or motor habits. So if you kind of repeatedly do the same action over and over, which might be like driving to work, for example, um, at first you have to use a lot of um, conscious cognitive control to kind of navigate the streets or look at your map and, and get you to where you want to go. But eventually if you do the, that action or that activity over and over, it can become habitual, we call it. Um, and so you can drive to work 
um, and without thinking too much about it, without using too much kind of cognitive resources, it becomes kind of a motor pattern. And this can be advantageous, it can help um, make things more efficient, but it can also be problematic if it becomes pathological in that the over-reliance or the over-development of motor habits could lead to things like compulsions um, or even an addiction. And so we thought that maybe um, changes in kind of the way this uh, brain region kind of uh, learns these motor habits might be involved in these repetitive restricted behaviors. And then the striatum is also important for um, allowing you to have behavioral flexibility, again, to kind of adapt your behavior, adapt your decisions and actions based on kind of changing environmental demands. And problems with the ability to do that can lead to inflexible behaviors. And so these are what this um, brain region normally does, and it carries out these actions by altering the strength of these synaptic connections between neurons. Um, and so that's where our focus was. So again, the idea was that mutations in these genes that cause autism and, and other related neurodevelopmental disorders are altering kind of the synaptic communication in these brain regions and circuits in a way that's facilitating the formation of fixed motor routines and habits, and at the same time, maybe reducing the ability to be flexible. And so this was what we wanted to investigate. And so um, I'll try not to um, overwhelm too many details about these cells and these circuits, but there's just a couple of uh, things to know. So this, um, again, this is a mouse brain, and um, these are images from a mouse brain. And in red, um, we can see with a red fluorescent protein, the striatal cells are highlighted. And the striatum is this um, large brain region here that's really kind of the input center for this structure, where a lot of these um, synaptic plasticity and learning is happening. And there are actually two types of striatal neurons, and they project to different downstream brain regions. So here are these circuits. And kind of the coordinated activity of these two cell types is important for um, motor learning and habit formation. And so we are interested in looking at these um, particular cells. And we've also been interested in the context of TSC at looking at these other types of neurons called dopamine neurons, which modulate the activity of these other cells. So these are the, the key cells we've been interested in to understand whether these mutations affect their synaptic function and activity. And here, just very briefly, um, I'm not going to go into our work on TSC because, as I said, we have now some new data um, on Syngap that may be more of interest. But just to put up a couple of the references um, for papers, if you're interested, that we published on TSC. Basically, um, what we found, um, or I should say, these are the postdocs and graduate students in my lab who found who worked on this. We have found that um, mutations in TSC affect the activity of these striatal neurons um, and that this leads to increased um, learning of a fixed motor routine, which again, we think could result in the development of kind of re repetitive restricted behaviors. And we've also found that this TSC mutation affects these dopamine neurons, which modulate the activity of these cells. And when TSC is disrupted in these cells, it leads to behavioral inflexibility or perseveration. Um, and so we do see that changes in these um, cells um, do drive behaviors that may be relevant for these restricted, repetitive, and flexible behaviors. And so based on this work, we wanted to explore the possibility about whether other autism risk genes or other genes involved in neurodevelopmental disorders might do something similar. And so that's where we started this project again um, just a couple of years ago. That's led by project scientist um, Julian, who Mike and Ashley um, have met. And we got really interested in Syngap um, and wanted to understand whether alterations in Syngap function might um, lead to some of the same behavioral and synaptic changes. And one of the reasons we were excited about looking at Syngap, um, first, um, really nice work, of course, from Rick Huguenier's lab and Gavin Remba have clearly established that Syngap is a very important synaptic protein, and we are interested in looking at synapses. Um, and I would say the majority of the work so far has focused on Syngap function in the cortex and hippocampus and how alterations in uh, synapses there might lead to impaired um, intellectual ability or altered learning 
um, or possibly even epilepsy. But if you look at this, um, this is a pretty uh, relatively old study that looked at the expression patterns of Syngap in the mouse brain. You can see that in addition to the cortex, which are blue, which means that they have high levels of Syngap expression, you can also see very high levels of Syngap expression in this brain structure here, which is, which is the striatum, which is the one I just introduced you to. So we were excited about this, that Syngap is highly expressed in the striatum. And there's a recent study that just came out from Alex Bay's lab where they looked at the expression of Syngap protein um, in these different brain regions um, across different developmental times. And just this is just to show you that the striatum is here. This is hippocampus and cortex. So you can see that Syngap protein really is strongly expressed in striatum and shows kind of these similar developmental dynamics as it does in these other brain regions. So we're excited to investigate what is the function of Syngap in these striatal neurons and could alterations in these striatal neurons be contributing to some of the behavioral changes in individuals with Syngap. Okay, so we had a look at this in terms of um, Syngap expression in our own lab. And so this again is a section of a mouse brain. Uh, this is just a wild type um, normal mouse. And in green, we are looking at the um, mRNA levels of Syngap1. And so again, you can see very strong expression here in the cortex, hippocampus, but also in this um, striatum. And I mentioned previously that there are two different types of striatal neurons that um, kind of differentially control behavior. And these two cell types can be um, distinguished by the fact that one type expresses a certain type of dopamine receptor, D1, and the other type expresses a different dopamine receptor, D2. And so we saw that Syngap1 was expressed in both types of these uh, striatal cells, and that's quantified here. So the vast majority of these um, D1 or direct pathway type cells and D2 or indirect pathway type cells express Syngap. So again, I think a relevant to study how alterations in Syngap would affect these cells. Okay, so in order to study this, we needed um, mouse models where we can manipulate the expression of Syngap1 to understand um, what happens. And so we were very um, lucky to get in touch with Gavin Rumba, who very kindly sent us um, the mouse models he's generated for um, studying Syngap. And so what we have in the lab now is a really nice full panel of genetic mouse models. So we have these um, Syngap mice, um, which are heterozygous, um, which have essentially Syngap1 haploinsufficiency in all cells. And this is um, thought to be um, kind of perhaps most relevant to what might happen in, in an individual with Syngap disorder. Um, but to kind of further drill down on which cell types are responsible for um, disease-related phenotypes, we also have these um, conditional knockout mice in which Syngap1 is only disrupted in a specific cell type. And I won't go into the details of how we generate these animals, but I'm happy to answer questions. But basically, we have mice that just have disrupted one or two copies of Syngap1 only in these direct pathway striatal cells or only in these indirect pathway striatal cells, and the rest of the brain and body um, have normal Syngap expression. And so these mice allow us to test whether these particular cells are responsible for any um, specific behavior changes. And I'll show you, I'm gonna show you some preliminary data um, from each of these models. Okay, so first we have, um, and I, sh I should say that this is very much still a work in progress. So none of this is published yet, and a lot of this data was actually obtained quite recently. So um, we're still working on this, but I just want to share kind of a few bits of um, data that we've gathered so far that I think look interesting. So one of the things, one of the behavioral phenotypes that has been previously observed in these mice with um, global haploinsufficiency of Syngap1 um, is this hyperactivity. In when the mice are placed in an open arena. So they, we just place the mice in an opti, open empty box essentially and record their activity over some amount of time and we see how much they move around. And so this is a very basic behavior characterization. And you can see these mice that have loss of one copy of Syngap1 show this um, pretty um, profound hyperactivity, meaning they're running around a lot more um, when placed in this open arena. And we were interested in wondering if alterations in these striatal cells might be responsible. 
And so we looked in these, um, again, these cell type specific mice, where again, SYNGAP1 is only altered in a particular cell type. And interestingly, we didn't really see um, any hyperactivity when we disrupted SYNGAP1 in these direct pathway striatal cells, or really in these indirect pathway striatal cells, um, although there was maybe a small change in these um, knockout animals. So this suggests that um, this particular behavior phenotype um, in the SYNGAP1 hapoinsufficient mice is not likely to be driven or, or can't be sufficiently caused by changes in the striatum. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. Um, so that's a, a little bit of negative data, but I think it helps us interpret um, our subsequent data. So that's just basic um, activity. What about um, more specific aspects of motor function? And so one um, pretty easy thing, uh, easy test we can do in mice is uh, we can measure their motor co coordination and we can measure their um, motor learning. And so the way we do that is kind of um, a little bit of a strange test where we put these mice on this rotating treadmill and that's called a rotor rod. And what we do is we first start this treadmill rotating at a relatively low speed um, and the mice have to walk along the treadmill to keep up. Um, and what we do is um, we do multiple trials. So we put them on the, the, this rotating treadmill for about five minutes at a time. And we measure basically um, how long they can stay on this um, rod before they start to lose coordination. And we slowly increase the acceleration over the five minutes. And so the length of time these mice can kind of perform this task is a measure initially of their motor coordination. But then after multiple days of multiple trials, it becomes a learning test where the mice will get better and better at this naturally. So their motor performance improves. And this motor learning um, is thought to be due to um, plus synaptic plasticity within these striatal cells that I've been talking about. And so how do the um, SYNGAP1 mice perform on this test? Um, well, what we found, so here are, is showing the performance of these animals across these multiple trials. And this is um, essentially their, um, their performance. And you can see in gray or um, silver are the wild type or normal animals that have normal SYNGAP expression. And they have um, this initial motor performance and then basically each day they get better and better until they can um, perform quite well on this test. And what we found is that these mice that have lost one copy of SYNGAP1, they have actually um, re slightly reduced initial performance in this test, which means that they had some slight impairment in their motor coordination. Um, and they um, don't really catch up or they don't really learn as well as, their, um, as the wild type litter mates that have normal SYNGAP1 expression. So this is a rel relatively subtle phenotype, but clearly shows that these animals have um, reduced motor coordination and perhaps reduced ability for motor learning. And I think um, that kind of fits with some of the um, from some of the findings in individuals with SYNGAP of um, potentially impaired motor function or, or, or motor developmental delay. Okay, so what about these mice that have disruption of SYNGAP1 just in these striatal cells? So interestingly, when we look at mice that only have SYNGAP1 disrupted, either one copy, which is heterozygous mice, or both copies disrupted, which are these knockout mice, and compare them to their um, wild type siblings, all of these mice perform essentially the same, suggesting that loss of SYNGAP1 from this, this particular cell type doesn't impact this um, behavior performance. However, this is where um, things started to get pretty interesting. If we just disrupt SYNGAP1 expression from these indirect pathway striatal cells, um, now we can see that both the heterozygous in light blue and these homozygous knockout in dark blue animals perform worse um, at this task compared to their siblings. 
And so again, they have um, these mice have reduced initial motor performance slightly, and they show um, reduced learning across. Um, they can learn, they do improve with this task, but they never reach um, the performance of their um, wild type counterparts. And so this is pretty interesting. This suggests that um, just disrupting SYNGAP1 in these specific cells, which are again, one population of striatal cells, is sufficient to fully um, recapitulate this motor coordination and motor learning impairments. And so I think this is helpful for us um, to understand that these cells might be kind of the origin of this um, impairments. And if we were interested in potentially treating it, we would want to um, potentially try to adjust the activity of these cells, and that might be um, sufficient to um, help improve motor coordination and learning. Okay. All right, so this was, um, I think, some compelling evidence that the striatum is involved in at least some of the behavior phenotypes in the SYNGAP mice, and that in particular, these indirect pathway cells might be um, particularly relevant. Okay, so those were um, some basic um, motor function, motor coordination, but we were interested in getting back to this question of um, whether these kind of restricted repetitive inflexible behaviors are due to alterations in the ability to learn and form motor habits. And there's actually um, a pretty nice way we can test this in mice. And so I'll just walk you through um, this behavior test that we did to try to assess this. And then um, please let me know if you have questions about this. So the way we can test um, kind of habit formation in a mouse is to train them on this lever pressing task. So we have um, a, a behavior box that has these um, levers that are designed for mice. And the mice are um, a little bit hungry, so they are motivated um, to look for food. And what we do is we give them a few um, sessions to learn that if they press this lever, they will get a food pellet as a reward. And at first, the mice are um, a little bit confused and it takes them a little while to understand this, but eventually, um, after multiple trials, after multiple exposure, the mice learn that if they press this lever, they'll get the reward. So we train this mice on this task and we make it um, more and more challenging over time where they have to press the lever more and more times to receive their award. And so normal mice will learn this task and I'll show you that data in a second and will learn to press the lever um, for their food reward. And then what we do um, is we do this so-called um, devaluation test. So after the mice have been trained and have learned to do this, we test whether they are pressing this lever in a gold, so-called goal-directed way, or whether they're just pressing this lever kind of out of habit. And the way we can do this is we essentially, before the test, we give the mice access to the reward, right? So we just give them the food pellets in their cage, right? And so they can eat these food pellets and they should be fully sated and they should not be hungry and they should not be particularly interested in pressing the lever anymore because they just got all the food pellets they want. And so the, what we do then is put them back in the box just for a few minutes and see how much they press the lever. And if the mice were pressing the lever because they're trying to get this goal, which is the food reward, they will not press very much if they've just had access to that food reward, right? So why would they bother? Um, they're not really interested in the food. And so we see this decrease in lever pressing once this reward has been devalued. Alternatively, we um, um, do a control where we give them access to something else and we put them back in the box. And if, again, they should still, in that situation, still be interested in pressing the lever to get the food. So in response to the control, they will still press the lever, but in response to this um, devaluation, they will not. And if this, if this pattern is true, then these mice are goal-directed, meaning they're going in to do this task in a goal-directed way. And it's known that this kind of goal-directed strategy is fairly flexible, such that if the um, testing conditions or the environment change, then the mice would adapt to achieve a new goal. Okay, and this is how we, we operate um, every day when we make decisions um, and, and choose our actions. However, if the mice are doing this out of habit, meaning that they just see the lever and because they've been pressing the lever so much, they just go ahead and press anyway without really consciously thinking about it or without you know, consciously trying to obtain a specific goal, then they will press the lever just as much 
on the control day and the food day. So even though they've just gotten all this food pellet reward, um, they're still just going to go ahead and press the lever. And, and that's how we can, um, that's how we test this in mice. Okay, hopefully that was clear. Um, so here are our results. So whoop, that was supposed to be animated. Okay. So here are, again, these um, mice that have global haploinsufficiency of SYNGAP1. So again, loss of one copy of SYNGAP1 in every cell. And this is what their performance looks like in this task. Um, this is how much they're pressing the lever, which is we use that as a measure of how well they're learning. And these are trials, which is basically each day, and they go in for about an hour. Um, into the little box each day. So you can see initially the mice press very little because they don't quite understand that pressing the lever gets them food. Um, but after some point, they, beginning to, they begin to press the lever and they begin to know that they can earn food this way. Oh, my mouse, there it goes. And then we start making it more and more challenging here. Um, and I won't, the details of these numbers don't really matter, but you can see the, these are the control mice. They start pressing more and more to earn their reward. And so they're learning this task. And interestingly, these mice with um, loss of one copy of Syngap, um, they don't show initial um, kind of difference in their lever pressing behavior, but they um, at some point become start to press the lever many more times than their um, wild type counterparts. And um, it's possible that this could be kind of due to their hyperactivity, but we actually don't think so. We think it might be something else and we um, it might be something with their um, motivation to learn. Um, this is something we're still trying to figure out. So they're not impaired in their ability to learn this task. If anything, they um, learn it much better or much more robustly. Um, but this is where the interesting thing comes. So after they do this, um, they learn this task, we do this um, value devaluation testing. Okay, and so here are the control animals in gray. And what you can see is that um, this is the performance of the mouse on the D-value day, basically how much did it press the lever. And again, um, it shouldn't press the lever very much because it's not hungry and it's not interested in earning the reward. And here on the value day, it should press the lever a lot because it's still interested in getting the reward. And so you can see all of these control mice are what we would call goal-directed, meaning they show very different performance under these two conditions. However, here are the mice with loss of um, uh, SYNGAP1. And you can see, first of all, there's huge variability. So the individual mice are um, kind of all over the place, let's say, in terms of their performance. But they certainly are not showing this consistent goal-directed behavior. In fact, some of these mice are pressing more during the D-value day than the value day, which is essentially kind of opposite of what we might expect um, or opposite of what this normal performance is. And then this is just kind of a, another way to show this data that shows the devaluation index. So the higher the score, the more goal-directed the mice are. And the, if the score is negative, they're more habitual or less goal-directed. And you can see, again, there's a much wider spread for these um, Syngap um, mice. And so this suggests that um, these mice have really altered um, ability to do this goal-directed action. And maybe at least some of these animals doing this behavior in a much more habitual way. Okay, so this was pretty interesting um, to see. So how about the mice where we just delete SYNGAP1 from striatal cells? And this is again, still in progress. So we've only done this for these indirect pathway cells. And what we find is something strikingly similar. So here are the lever presses during learning. Again, these are the control animals. This is a completely different set of mice now. And these are mice with loss of SYNGAP1 just in these indirect pathway cells only. And they have the same um, kind of increased lever press behavior that emerges over time. Um, and again, remember these particular mice were not hyperactive. And so again, we think there's another reason they may be kind of really vigorously pressing the lever in this task that we, we need to figure out. And again, strikingly similar to those um, kind of global um, heterozygous animals, 
these mice with loss of one copy of Syngap just in indirect pathway cells also show this really varied response on this um, devaluation testing. Again, the wild type animals all show this very clear goal directed behavior where they're suppressing their lever pressing, where they're suppressing the lever pressing under devalued conditions. Um, and these Syngap mice, um, again, have wide um, variability with some mice, again, um, pressing more even during devalue day, suggesting that they um, are doing this behavior um, kind of in a very different way or for very different reasons um, than control animals would. And again, this is um, still fairly preliminary data, so we're still trying to kind of understand um, where this is coming from. I will say that we tested both male and females um, mice, and it's not um, due to a sex difference. It's not that the females perform one way, the males perform another way. So we, we need to work to understand this variability, but clearly these animals are doing something different um, than the controls. Okay, and again, these indirect pathway striatal cells may be really the most relevant cell type, and, the, and disruption of syngap in these cells seems to be um, disrupting this kind of flexible goal-directed behavior. Okay, and so very last thing I'll just share with you. So we've um, been looking at these behaviors, um, and we think there's some quite interesting things here. Um, and so what's happening at the cellular level? And so you may have likely heard in other talks that um, Syngap is, is a synaptic protein, although it may have other functions to be uncovered, um, but certainly it's very um, highly expressed at synapses. And these striatal neurons um, have these dendritic spines, um, which you can see. So here's a striatal neuron from, a, oops, sorry, that's supposed to be a wild type, this a wild type animal. And here are these dendrites. Um, and here, these little um, protuberances are the dendritic spines, which is where the synapses are formed. And we can look at the number of these and the size of them to get a sense of um, synaptic function. And so here is what one of these spines looks like in one of a normal striatal cell. And here is a cell from um, the Syngap-1 heterozygous mice. And this is one of these indirect pathway cells. And you can see the cells overall are, are fairly normal. They look pretty similar. But if you look closely at these spines, um, it does look different, right? So what you can see is that these spines appear larger. The individual spines are bigger and perhaps um, less dense. And so we can actually quantify that. Again, this is still fairly um, preliminary data. But Similar to what people have seen in other brain regions, loss of Syngap-1 seems to increase um, the size of these um, dendritic spines, which again are a proxy um, for the strength of the synaptic connections. Um, this is kind of a more subtle effect, but we clearly see also a reduction in the number of these spines um, or the density of these spines, which is a proxy for the number of synapses. And again, these are the, in these indirect pathway cells, which we see are really driving some of the um, behavior phenotypes. So this is um, just kind of a, a little preliminary evidence that indeed syn loss of Syngap is affecting the structure and number of these spines and is likely going to affect synaptic properties and synaptic plasticity. And that's what um, we're working on now. We're gearing up to do a lot of experiments to understand how synapses might be altered in these cells, because that's going to be important um, for us to understand how this, these uh, cells are affecting uh, behavior. OK, so um, I will stop there. I'll just quickly summarize. So what we've found so far, again, this is very much a work in progress. Um, is that Syngap-1 is um, certainly highly expressed in this brain region called the striatum in both types of these um, striatal cells. And that loss of Syngap-1 in these cells does appear to affect um, their dendritic spine structure and number. And we expect that there will be effects on synaptic communication that we're very interested in pursuing. And that these mice um, with global loss of Syngap, they do exhibit hyperactivity, impaired motor coordination, impaired motor routine learning, and what looks like reduced goal-directed behavior, which we think are relevant mouse behavior phenotypes that might provide some insight into um, behavior changes in individuals with Syngap uh, mutations. And we've pinpointed this particular type of striatal cell that um, seems to be sufficient to um, cause some of these behavior changes and that we're very much interested in pursuing further. 
And so very quickly, um, kind of what we're doing now and in the future. So I think there's a lot of other behaviors that would be very interesting to look at, um, kind of looking at the clinical summaries of, of what types of problematic behaviors individuals have. I think things like impulsivity, problems with attention, problems with flexibility, and maybe even more simple motor parameters like gait are things that we can look at in mice, and we are interested in doing that. Um, we have a lot of work to do to understand um, more about the cellular function, including synaptic changes. Um, and then if we can, you know, once we've established these uh, phenotypes at the cellular and behavior level, then um, we'd really like to see if these can be improved, right? So the whole goal is if we understand which cell types are important, what changes are happening in those cell types, we would have a better idea about what we could do to treat these behavioral conditions. Um, and so we're pursuing a couple of approaches. One is to use these um, genetic restoration a mouse model that Gavin Rumba has developed um, to see if we restore syngap expression in striatum, does that restore behavior? Um, and then looking to the future, you know, could we use an um, even more sophisticated kind of genetic rescue strategy um, to improve some of these phenotypes um, that could be given to mice um, even after they've developed uh, problems. And so this um, is something that's fairly far, far off that we haven't really started with yet, but I think is um, where we're, we're going in the future. Okay, so um, I'll stop there and just quickly think um, these are the people in my lab and I think I mentioned um, Gillian is the person who's leading this project and he had some help on the recent behavior analysis from a really talented undergrad, Darren, um, who actually I think Ashley and Mike met when we went um, to see the mice in action. Um, so again, thank you so much for having me and I'm uh, very happy to answer questions and, and hear your feedback. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Beta. Um, we have a small-ish and high-functioning group here, so after I spit out a few questions, I'm just going to ask people to um, take themselves off mute and chime in. But I want to just throw two at you, actually three. Um, the first is on that on the strike. If I understood you correctly, and please correct me, you have further modified a mouse model that has. Where you, where, where you eliminate Syngap only in the striatum, not in the rest of the brain. Mm -hmm. And on those slides, you have both a het and a knockout because part of the layman's dogma among the parents is that uh, if, when, when you take Syngap completely out of a mouse, the mouse doesn't make it past a few days postnatal. Mm -hmm. So everyone who saw data on a knockout mouse was like, wait, what? So that's question one. Question two, your last two slides, your last two bullets on the last slide talked about rescue of the phenotype if you could sort of just talk a little bit about more about that because that is the question you know every parent is sitting here thinking time is brain and they're looking at their kid and they're like oh my god is it too late can they be helped like that's that's the obsession so if you could just no pressure please help our kids but i mean if you could just elaborate on this notion of rescue and, and what that might look like and, and translate that a little bit and the third thing just conscious of time and if we lose people at the end of the hour um, Sydney did a great job of, of previewing that um, Dr. Heller is talking in our next talk. And uh, she mentioned to us that she was happy to see you're talking because you guys were at Rockefeller together. So if you could just, if you're so inclined, tell us your assessment of, of, of how great Liz might be, that would, that, that would be welcome as well. But sure. up to you. Um, okay, sure, yeah. Um, I guess I'll start with the last one first. So yeah, Liz, um, it's great. Um, that's kind of the great thing about see, being in science is it is a small world and we run into people that we knew from long ago. So yeah, um, Liz Heller was a student at Rockefeller at the same time I was there. She was in the class uh, below me. Um, and yeah, she's an excellent scientist and she's just started her lab um, a few years ago at Penn. Um, and she did some really nice work both as a grad student um, and as a postdoc looking at epigenetic changes. And I, um, and I think she has a personal relationship to Syngap as well um, with a family member. And so I think it would be, as far as I understand, um, you know, epigenetics is not necessarily being looked at yet in the context of Syngap. And I don't know what her exact plans are, but I think um, it would be great to have her um, as part of this community. And I've said good things about all the support that I've gotten as a new member of this community and encouraged her to um, kind of put her efforts to, to study this. So I think that's great. I think bringing in people with different ideas and different perspectives is, is really a great way to go. 
Um, okay, so then uh, science questions. I guess the first question about the knockout, yes. So that's definitely true. We can't really generate um, animals that have a full knockout because that is lethal early postnatal. But when we do these cell type specific manipulations, um, we don't have problems with uh, viability or we don't have premature mortality and what it allows when we generate the mice we get um, complete knockouts anyway and it kind of can be helpful to include them because often the phenotypes are more pronounced and so if we see kind of subtle changes in the heterozygous animals and we see you know a similar change in the same direction that's more pronounced in the knockout animals that kind of just gives us more confidence um, about what we're looking at, because sometimes with the heterozygous, um, you can get subtle phenotypes. An interesting thing is for, at least for the spine density, we got the same phenotype in heterozygous mice and knockout animals, suggesting that really loss of one copy is, is enough to really disrupt that particular aspect, um, which I think is interesting. So I think it's kind of an interesting comparison to see whether the heterozygous are whether it's a gene dose dependent effect or the heterozygous animals are enough to cause complete, you know, as much um, problem as the complete knockout. So that's, that's why we can, we include them um, when we can um, for those studies. Um, and then, yes. Okay. The second question about, you know, what could we possibly do? This is obviously a, a critical question, especially for neurodevelopmental disorders. And, um, you know, I've thought a lot about it also for TSC. Um, so I think that the data look promising um, from Gavin's lab. I guess that he has that nice paper where they show um, rescue of some phenotypes with even postnatal restoration of SYNGAP1 expression. And so I think, and there's um, kind of similar things have been seen for TSC, um, not so much with gene restoration yet, but with uh, pharmacolo pharmacological treatment. Um, and there, a lot of work has been done that clearly, so for TSC, we have a drug that um, blocks the immediate signaling change. And it's clear that the earlier you give that drug in development, the better the outcomes are in people and in animals. Um, and people have defined kind of critical periods. And it's interesting because different aspects have different critical periods. Um, for, and again, for TSC, and it, this may be true for some of these other um, disorders as well. So, um, you know, certain things can be rescued or improved even later in life, even in adults. If you give them um, rapamycin, some of the behavior phenotypes improve, but not others. And then if you give, you know, the drug kind of in childhood, at some point in kind of childhood, you can improve more of the behaviors, but not everything. And if you give it very early, you know, essentially after the mice are born, you can kind of fix everything. So the developmental timing is critical. Um, I think some things might be more um, able to be improved later in life than others. So um, yeah, I think the earlier treatment can start the better, but it doesn't mean that there couldn't be beneficial outcomes even if there is a treatment that started later in life. Um, and I think the, the mice kind of can help us get a sense of that because we have the ability to control and test different potential therapies and different timing of delivery and see what kind of the critical windows might be. Um, and I guess in terms of what we could do, so for these striatal neurons, it's kind of nice because um, there is quite a lot of drugs that modulate their activity. So for example, antipsychotic drugs um, are targeting these cells. Um, and so if we knew, if we know what the change is, um, how these cells are affected, we could kind of come up with a drug or potential drugs to test that might restore the activity of these cells. So that's one thing we'll try. So kind of once we figured out what's going on, we might be able to try some uh, drug treatments. But I think the, um, you know, possibly the best way to do it would be a genetic strategy and, and kind of um, starting where with the primary insult, which is the mutation, right? Um, and there we can do kind of this proof of concept where if we um, restore expression um, in a particular cell type, we can, or throughout the brain, we can show that that rescues. Um, but I think that's not necessarily a viable, it's not a viable therapeutic approach. What we'd need would be something like ASO, right, or a gene therapy. Um, and those things, again, we can um, kind of, we haven't gotten into, but I think many people are, are thinking of, I'm sure, working on and could be tested. So once we've kind of established the phenotypes in our models, we can, we can try these things and, and see um, what, they, what they might be able to help with.
Well, Helen, this is Rick Huguner. I, I got to jump to another Zoom, but that was a great talk and um, uh, beautiful uh, preliminary data. So, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Good to see All you. Right. See ya. See you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Can you guys unmute yourself? Or yes, you can. So, so have at it. I see. I see. Catherine's ready to go. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. Beta. Thank you so much for that great talk. I was wondering. Uh, when you're talking about rescuing, could you, um, you know, one of my one of my big uh, sort of fears about ASO stuff in humans is going to be sort of maybe a mosaic patterning of delivery. And so I'm wondering, can you um, look at a mosaic patterning of rescue in the striatum and see what would happen as opposed to just like changing everything, you know, because with your mouse model, you can you have a lot more control. Mm -hmm. over yeah, what you're changing. Um, do you mean mosaic, meaning like not all cells will get the therapy, or do you mean yes. that it will only get into certain cell types, or perhaps both? Um, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure how okay. I, how those two would yeah. be different. I mean, I, I mean, into some, uh, when we're going to, like, when we're talking about gene therapy with our kids, I keep imagining some, you know, some cells getting the ASO and some not. Yeah, and having even a, like a variable, a variable uh, response on a cell to cell basis. So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's a challenge. I think that's a big challenge. Um, yeah, but you're right that it's something that we could try to address in animal models. Um, so I can tell you again, we have we're still trying to kind of establish the the, the phenotypes for Syngap. Um, and so we haven't necessarily moved to treating them yet, but for TSC, we have kind of started thinking more about that. And again, I think it would be somewhat of a similar strategy or a similar situation. Um, and so there, what we're doing is we have been using um, CRISPR-Cas9 um, or other ways to kind of manipulate the expression of genes. And for TSC, we, we chose not TSC itself, but kind of a downstream um, molecule that we wanted to suppress. And what we've been doing is we've been working um, with these viruses that are developed by the Gradinaro lab at Caltech that can be delivered systemically, that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and there we, we definitely see that not every cell gets the the viral um, gets the virus or, or expresses what we're trying to do express. And so uh, that is perhaps a good model for what would happen in reality, right, in people. Um, and so we're trying to see, is that kind of um, expression going to be enough to rescue phenotypes? And we're, you know, doing, we're hopefully got these new viruses just this week and are gonna try that in TSC, but we, we would be able to test that to try to mimic the delivery of an ASO or a CRISPR therapy or some other gene therapy, um, and which and try to use kind of the same delivery that you would in a person to capture that mosaicism or or whatever. So, yeah, it's an open question. Um, I think that it's possible that even with um, not having it expressed in every single cell, it may be enough to restore some function. Um, but it's something that definitely has to be tested. I think we can't say we can't say for sure without testing it. Thank you. Um, I actually had a second question, if I may. Um, in your uh, showing the learning behavior, you had the uh, the nice graphs where in the typical mice they went from a low activity to a high activity, and then with the syngap mice they had sort of a sort of starburst pattern, you know, they weren't, they weren't doing the same kind of learning. So half of them were maybe doing the same mm -hmm. as the wild type and the other half were doing basically the opposite or, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. So I was wondering with those trials, are those individual mice or are some of those mice, uh, are, are some of those like different trials with the same mouse? And so in, ultimately what I'd want to know is, can you take some of the mice that are doing the opposite and do they continually do the opposite or is it just random? is each mouse kind of random over time? That's a great question. Um, so the data points there, like each dot is an individual mouse. So, um, and there's some, we have tested something around, I think 10 or 12 mice. Um, so that's the performance of an individual mouse that we tested once. 
Um, it is possible um, to do multiple, we call them probe trials or test trials. It's possible that we could test these, the same mice repeatedly over time and see if this performance is stable. I think that would be an interesting thing to do. Um, we haven't done it yet. Um, we also would be interesting to look um, at the performance of an individual mouse across different types of behavior paradigms to see if there are kind of certain subgroups or specific patterns of responding that are reproducible or that are consistent in different assays. And yeah, I think looking at um, individual differences is really interesting and important. Um, but yeah, so I can't say how stable the behavior of those animal, those particular animals is because we only tested them once. But yes, it would be interesting if they were just kind of randomly doing something each time or if the ones that were goal-directed stayed goal-directed or the ones that were habitual stayed habitual over time. That's a great question. Can I, can I throw in one question and then pass it to, I think Dan Boat and Neil are ready to go. Um, I think if this, this talk is awesome and it's, it's, it's just good to know that there's someone else who's like digging deep in Syngap. But when I say to a parent, so Dr. Badab is really a striatum person who's digging in on Syngap and the striatum. And they say to me, well, what? like, I don't care about my kid's striatum versus their cerebellum. The whole brain's not working right now. Is my answer that that is super important? I mean, I'm not trying to be rude, please. Obviously, I'm just trying to like understand my talking points for other families. It, is it the answer that, you know, the striatum is so important that, and there's certain, it, what is it, is, I'm, I'm stuck on what you said about we can target the striatum with certain drugs, or can, can you help me translate the, this work to the average parent in terms of how this knowledge can be translated? Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. So, um, of course, I think for the perspective of the patient, we have to treat all of the problems and it's happening all throughout the brain, right? Um, so I understand that that um, perspective makes total sense. Um, I guess what we're trying to do is, um, so it's even more relevant for TSC where these um, genes are expressed in every single cell type in your body, right? And you, and individuals with these mutations have, you know, this constellation of problems, right? So, all right, and we don't think that all of these problems are caused by one particular cell type or one brain region or, you know, so we're trying to kind of dissociate them and understand where each of these aspects is coming from. So for Syngap, it's likely going to be the case that, you know, the intellectual disability and learning and memory problems and epilepsy are going to be probably driven by changes in cortex hippocampus would be my assumption. But that's not the whole picture, right? I mean, as you all know much more than me, there's all of these other behavioral um, challenges, right, that are, I, I believe, or I think might be driven by changes in the striatum or in the basal ganglia. So if we just were treating the cortical or hippocampal cells, we probably only affect a subset of the problems. Um, and so, you know, just based on my expertise and the fact that we have to kind of, you know, dig in somewhere, we have focused on, okay, let's look at the striatum and the basal ganglia because we think it's really responsible for this subset of behavioral um, problems, you know, related to the autism and the other behavioral conditions. And yes, you're right that if we know we can figure out what's going on and we had a drug that kind of restored the activity of those cells, we would likely only treat those particular behavioral problems, right? And then still kind of the epilepsy or the other issues would need to be addressed perhaps another way. So, um, but it's still, you know, I think it's important because some of those behavior challenges from what I've understood talking to parents are really challenging and they are not very much addressed clinically or in the research. So that's kind of, from, from me as just one scientist, one lab, that's our niche that we're gonna try to, try to tackle. But of course, um, there are other aspects that need to be looked at as well. Uh, yeah, and I wasn't saying, I, I just wanted to understand it better. Yeah. Thank you. There isn't a parent on this phone call who doesn't struggle with behaviors. I raise your hand if you do. But that's um, so. So Dan and then Neil. Yeah, I, I totally agree with um, what Helen said. I, you know, we kind of do the same things. Um, one thing I would I would think of portraying is kind of think of each as a, each of us as part of a, a much bigger team that's trying to get at all the answers. But we do it, and I think by by digging very deep in what um, we specialize in. And um, so you saw today, this, this was a fantastic talk, Helen. 
um, just the amazing toolkit that, that Helen has to actually get in there and come up with which cell type it is and how, how that, um, how a specific uh, manipulation in a cell type actually correlates with its uh, specific behavior. <clears throat> And I think that's, that's one of the keys is if we do understand what regions um, underlie specific behaviors, it allows us to get more specific later on. Like, um, and I know I study autism as well, and it's very, very different from person to person. Like um, just the, the spectrum alone of behaviors that you have, you might want um, more personalized medicine in the future where we can actually target specific behaviors. And it might allow us to look at specific brain regions um, as as a, not only a diagnostic, but maybe also as a therapeutic. Yeah. No, thank you. Neil, do you have a question? I'm going to do just one. Uh, I won't, uh, I won't, I won't believe you. One question. Believe However, you. Helen, it is going to be an incredibly unfair question for you. Um, so while you're figuring out the biology, and I'm with Mike and the others, very, very focused on that, that that's going to be very exciting. There is one other aspect that all parents have, which is, we're trying to deliver um, occupational therapies, learning therapies along the way. You've got educators, caregivers, parents. And I'm wondering, and you may not have anything now, but as you study these mouse models, it'd be awesome to see if there was ever an opinion your team had over, hey, look, if we focused on gross motor, in the first year of life and forgot everything else, that might be great. Because what I'm really wondering, and I've, you know, my daughter's 14, um, I don't want to leave anything on the table from a therapy point of view. And what triggered my thought was, you know, how does a Syngapian view goals differently, you know, over seconds, minutes, hours, days? And does that knowledge help a therapist um, educate? You know, in other words, can the actual OT, PT, speech, school learning change as a result of what you see in a mouse? That is a leap that no scientist would ever take, I understand. But as you link into behavioral sciences, if you think you want to throw a few bones off the bus, I think every parent would love to, to get any opinion because uh, we'll try any, anything crazy. Um, no, that's a, that is um, an awesome question and a great thought. So, yes, I think, I mean, ultimately, well, the stride and one, it's, it, one of its jobs is to do learning, right? And it, do, it doesn't do, you know, kind of um, spatial navigation or memorizing phone numbers type of learning. It does different types of learning, um, but it's still learning that can be potentially modified and trained um, with the right approach. So I think that's a great idea. I think, yeah, basic scientists have, um, at least biology, perhaps more so in psychology, have not been done so much in terms of behavioral interventions. It's probably challenging in mice. Um, but I think that's a great idea. I mean, yes, if we see, if we know more about what strategy these mice are using or why they're performing, you know, differently in these, there are learning tasks, right? Why their ultimate behavior is different. We could think about, um, you know, different training regime or, you know, for all of these types of training tasks, we have parameters that we can tweak or train, you know, maybe if we train them for longer, they will have more similar performance. Or maybe if we train them with a slightly different strategy, then maybe they would, um, you know, perform more along the line. So that's a great suggestion. Um, I think that would be great to try. Um, I do, we have a colleague of mine, Linda Wilbrecht, who's in the psychology department and she is very interested in that. So she's um, not so much studying disorders per se, but studying you know, how we learn um, and the neural circuits behind it. And if we know that, then we can devise much better um, inter behavioral intervention strategies to kind of modulate or adjust that learning. Or if we, know kind of what individuals with autism, how they learn, um, you know, and that might be kind of abnormal. We can kind of use that to help them learn um, kind of the things that we're trying. So yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. Again, it's just challenging to do it in mice. Mice are um, not the easiest um, to get them to do what you want them to do, but I think it's something that could be considered and is a great idea. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Any other parents chiming in? Sydney, Martha, Peter, JJ, Pavel? There's a couple. Of yeah, questions. I have a question. 
Oh, oh sorry, I have to go to the chat. Go ahead, Marta. Oh, no, I, I, I know you mentioned that maybe some antipsychotics, you were expecting that they will improve the indirect pathway of the cells. That is what you show in your study that was the problem with Singap. What are you expecting? Like, I know there are some kids that we have, I think, in Effexor that they said it, they are doing better with behavior. And, and to the point that you said that uh, probably behavior is not our first goal, actually, I think there was um, the, in one of the questions that we asked to all the parents, behavior was one of the goals to control better than even seizures because it's such a big deal for us. Then, I mean, this is very helpful for us to have some guidance on behavior. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I, I should say that, um, you know, the antipsychotics I just threw out as an example of kind of a class of drugs where you have a lot of different types that have differential activity at different types of receptors that are all very much in the striatum. And so um, I, I can't say yet if those types of drugs or which one would be helpful because I think we don't know yet enough about the cellular biology of how the syngap mutation affects the activity of these cells. So basically we need to know is there, at a very crude level, is there too much activity in these cells or too little? Or is the activity fine, there's just abnormal plasticity perhaps. So I think once we have done those experiments, which again, you know, over the next six months is really um, our focus, then I'll have a much better answer of what we might be able to do pharmacologically to kind of tweak the activity of these cells. Um, so yeah, I can't, unfortunately I can't say at this point what would be a good strategy, um, but soon again, when we know more about the cell activity, cell biology, we might have a better um, idea of what would be good to try. And then again, we could in theory try them in, in the animal models. Thank you. AJ, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it? Stephen's asleep. Okay, so Dr. Beta, if you go to the chat, I can read this to you too, but it's a long one. How, how can the biology correlate to therapy and medications to help recur indirect dopamine cell? Recur, I think recur means rescue, indirect dopamine cells. If meds can restore the function of these affected cells, would you expect behavior and learning? Yeah, so- I hope some heavy hitting parents on this call. No, it's great. I mean, I, I think it's great. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna make sure I understand. Right, so yeah, so this is exactly the goal is that, um, yeah, again, once we have a bit more information about what's kind of wrong with these cells or what these cells are doing differently, let's say, um, when they have disrupted syngap, then I think we might have at least, um, you know, in terms of therapies that could be given to patients, that would be the next step, but we would at least have a bunch of pharmacological tools that we could test in mice, right? At least to do the proof of concept, right? If we were to, slightly upregulate the activity of this receptor or slightly, you know, decrease the activity of that receptor that would restore the cellular function. Um, and we would test then, is that sufficient to improve the behavior? That would be the ultimate test because if we kind of fixed or improved the cellular biology, but the animal still had abnormal behavior, that's obviously not going to be a great thing to pursue as a therapy. So yeah, I think the question is about, um, yeah, we would want a medication that targeted the cells and the cellular um, problems and fix those first or you know improve the function and then absolutely test if that was good enough to improve the behavior because and if it was then that suggests that it's kind of a potential promising thing and the next step would be to look and see if there's drugs that target those receptors or pathways that are already you know fda approved and you know if not go from there. So that that's would be the process that we would go down. I have a broad and, and more unfair question than Neil had that I'd love to throw at you because you're so smart. You'll say something cool. But before I do that, any other parents have things they want to chime in here? Yeah. Yes, just one quick question, um, Dr. Beta on, um, I might have missed this earlier in the in the discussion. I had a work call, so my apologies. On TSC, um, did you guys, have you guys identified any sort of medication to improve the behavior in TSC and what does that look like? Yeah, so TSC, it's a little bit different. Um, so the, there is an FDA approved drug, which um, it's rapamycin or kind of the, I forget the, the derivatives of rapamycin. Um, and it works by blocking the activity of this um, protein called mTOR. 
Um, and that's because this TSC complex is a direct negative regulator of mTOR. And so when you have mutations in TSC, this complex is no longer functional and you have basically deregulated or, or mTOR signal that's always on. So this drug blocks the activity of that kind of next step downstream target. Um, and this is fairly effective. Um, so it works for the tumor. It helps to um, kind of reduce the tumor burden in patients. It's pretty effective for seizures, but not perfect. So I think the, the first major clinical trial showed something like 40% seizure reduction in 40% of patients. So pretty good, but not um, complete. The challenge is they recently did clinical trials for autism and cognitive impairments in TSC, and unfortunately those failed with rapamycin. There was two different trials, um, and the reasons suggested were that either the treatment was started too late, so I think most of the people enrolled were um, older children or teenagers, maybe even adults, I don't remember, um, but I think you know the youngest was probably like six or eight, um, and the trials only went for six months. Um, they thought maybe that wasn't long enough. Um, other possibilities are that rapamycin doesn't get into the brain all that well. And in our mouse models, we've actually seen that it has incomplete effect on dopamine neurons, for example, which we think are important for the cognitive inflexibility. So if the drug is not getting into those cells, then that might also be a reason why it didn't work very well for that particular behavior, but that's purely speculative. So that's the strategy for TSC. The problem is that um, or the current strategy, the um, for epilepsy, other you know other types of medications have been employed, um, and most recently, um, cannabidiol CBD has been used with success for the epilepsy. Um, so those are the things in the in TSC. Rapamycin is a little problematic because you have to give pretty high doses to get it into the brain, and there are systemic problems because mTOR is expressed everywhere in the body. And so there's problems with like liver, um, like kind of met metabolic problems, there's immune suppression. So it's not great to be on that, um, but it does improve um, some aspects. So we have been for TSC working on a genetic strategy that would be a little bit more targeted and at least trying to show proof of concept that we could do it just in the brain to kind of avoid these more systemic problems. and. Again, it's it's pretty early, but we're um, that's what we're pursuing for TSC. Thank you, Catherine. I see you're unmuted. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to just say I have a 19 year old son, and I really um, the habituation and behavior stuff is really you know top of mind for us. And I heard you use a word early in your talk that uh, the word addiction, and I have for a long time thought that my son behaves kind of like he gets addicted to some behaviors. Mm -hmm. So he'll like enjoy something, like say take a carousel ride at the zoo, he'll enjoy it. I'll start leveraging that to get him to do some work because that's the only way you can get him to do anything is to give him, you know, sort of show here, you're gonna get this thing, now do the work, he'll do the work, then he gets the thing. And so then the carousel rides, elevator rides, certain foods, songs, like any, any of the things I can name that have been his kind of rewards they start out as making him happy, then they make him really happy, then they make him sort of super weirdly excited. Then pretty soon after that, he'll be um, over time, you know, as this is going on, he'll start, you know, sort of screaming and being seeming like he's in pain. And then he'll just start this huge injurious behavior cycle. And it sort of has taken me a long time to understand that, like, ev pretty much everything's going to sort of be poisoned in this way at some point. And so not giving him the same things, even though they're the things he likes and I'd like to give him the things he likes. I kind of have to stop the cycle myself. And so I just wanted to put that out there as a, um, something that I hope you can um, sort of look at. I might not be the same in the mice, but that sort of habituation is really interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, that's helpful to hear about and learn about. I mean, these brain circuits and the cells that we're talking about are exactly the ones or, or th that are involved in addiction. Um, and there is, I think, some overlap in terms of the um, cell, at least at the cellular and circuit level, um, where that's part of the hypothesis. Um, and not just addiction, but also um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, people have looked in animal models at these same cells and circuits. And so the idea is that there may be these synaptic changes in these cells that, yes, are causing kind of um, 
increased habit formation and that might manifest slightly differently um, in addiction or compulsion or repetitive behavior, but that the same kind of culprits might be at play. And there's a nice art, nice review article or a couple of review articles that were written um, by some junior faculty that are working on other autism risk genes where they specifically say, you know, changes in these addiction circuits might be also important for autism and for these repetitive and flexible behaviors. So very like almost exactly what you're suggesting. Um, so I do think that there are some common pathways here. I don't, yeah, I don't, I think there are some key differences. It's not addiction per se, but I think some of the same kind of overlearning or kind of positive feedback um, may also happen to cause um, these kind of fixated or inflexible interests. Um, and so that's a great point. Um, first, Catherine, thank you. I mean, this, this gene was only identified clinically 10-ish 10, 10 years ago, right? So most of us have kids who are under 10. A few people like Neil have teenagers and then Catherine. So when we, when we meet older parents that you can see the rest of us get extra quiet when they talk because we want to, my I, older parents, I mean parents of older kids, we get very quiet because we want to hear exactly what they're saying because we're all terrified about the future. And I just want to second what Catherine said. Tony loves stuff. He loves it more. It loves it more. He works it. It becomes an obsession. It's a nightmare. And I'm so sick of cars. Now we're, now I know, now I own every Mr. Men book in the world. You know, I just, I just need to keep his obsessions less than $5 each. Um, but my, here's my tough question for you, Helen, because you're sitting here talking about drugs, and as you, you, as you surely know, and every parent on this call knows, you know, Stoke released a paper, and now their ASO that may be promising for Syngap, and they may bring to commercially develop, is, could happen. And we know that Rick presented a, a, a potential ASO at our the SRF roundtable at AES last year, and we know that at least one other and then we, you know, in the last call, we had Professor Cadam here who was talking about a potential drug that, anyway, so there's these talks of ASOs and then there's talks of drugs and then there's talks of prime editing and all this future sci-fi. And some parents look at me and say, well, why are we talking about drugs? Because if we have an ASO, won't that cure it? And I have, and I find myself in this conversation where it's like, well, look, A, we don't know about delivery. B, we don't know how efficacious it's going to be or how much it's going to cost. And you know the ASO. I've had some. I've heard some people refer to it as well. It's a workaround, but it doesn't solve the problem for that many prime editing, which in my head goes into the sci-fi more than five years out bucket. And then there's people who are like. And then I talk to the leadership of say the Fragile X organization. Right when Fragile X started doing research, they were like, we were all about ASOs and gene therapy. And you know what's helped the most kids? Good old-fashioned small molecules. Like, do not give up on small molecules. So, I love your perspective on this. But what I say to parents is. It's not obvious that what therapy is going to work on what kid, and it's better to have a lot of arrows in your quiver. So yes, ASOs could be game changing, but we could still have symptoms we need to treat. There could be some things we can't rescue. So we need some, and one day when it's cost effective and it's available, all of these other future gene therapies, yes, by all means, but don't think, oh, we have an ASO, we're done, is what I say to people. So you're the professor, would you correct or amend my little speech there and tell me how I can appropriately in your opinion talk to other parents about this um well i think i mean I, I think you're exactly right and i should say that um you know i'm a research scientist not a clinician so that's an important disclaimer um but i think i would agree 100 percent that it's important to have an arsenal of approaches right especially for kind of complex disorders that may present differently in different people that have um, different aspects that may need to be treated differently that more are more or less amenable to different things. So I think absolutely, you know, having a multitude of things to be able to throw at the problem is going to be, you know, most likely the best way to go. Um, you know, I, per I personally agree with the opinion that, you know, maybe now or in the future that these kind of gene type targeted therapies are really going to be helpful because yes, they will kind of get to the source of the problem, but they're still new enough and there's still a lot of questions like um, I think Catherine was bringing up about the delivery and will it hit all the cell, as many cells as you need and will it hit the right cells? Like these are really unanswered questions, right? Um, and they will be answered slowly, but it's gonna take you know clinical trials and a lot of work. So um, I think it's absolutely worth pursuing those things because if they work, they will, that's what we want, right? But yeah, there are a lot of, you know, they may or may not work or there, there may be still a lot of troubleshooting and trial and error to figure out first. 
So what I was kind of suggesting, you know, and the reason I brought up antipsychotics, again, not that I think that that's necessarily the, the specific thing we want to do, but those are available now, right? And could be, and are at least some things are fairly well tested and kind of the risks are known. Um, and there are things that could be tried to kind of improve behavior immediately, potentially, right? Um, so I, I think that, you know, gathering information about if any of those things could be helpful, you know, right now, um, even, or, you know, potentially even in older individuals, um, that's, I think, important, right? So I think you want to have all of those things. And um, yes, if one of those kind of ASOs or gene therapy approaches ends up working um, and all of the hurdles are crossed, then we may not need those other small molecules, but I, you know, it might be a while. And as you said, the cost and the invasiveness of those things is also consideration. Again, small molecule drug is um, relatively inexpensive, relatively, you know, low risk in terms of administering it. Um, so yeah, I think, I think pursuing any and all of those things is worthwhile at this point. Thank you. And thank you for your time and your accessibility and being so um, gracious with, with this. As I, I, we're an hour and a half, so we're probably past whatever anybody thought this would be. Are there <laughs> any other questions you want to throw at? Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Badup. Thank you for the families. Thanks, Jillian, for being here. Um, and Anna and Daniel. Anna, you can say you. Thank you very much. Not good. Okay. Thank Thanks you. This was, this was great. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Thanks for organizing, making Sydney. And if you have any questions or you wanna to talk to families or parents or whatever, let us know, we're here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Again, it's been um, great to kind of be part of this very engaged community. It, it makes what we're doing, uh, you know, it gives us the, the immediate relevance of what we're doing, which is really helpful. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. All right, take care.